Thank you. Um, yeah, we're talking about chapter four, actually, uh, which was chapter five when we started this club. And um, yeah, it wraps up uh, the previous chapters by introducing a slightly more complex app, a shiny app. And yeah, we learned to do that, to build a more complex shiny app. And um, yeah, we learned how, how to build this app, how to go from the process of, for example, in this example, data exploration to build a prototype app and go on step by step uh, building a more complex app, uh, which is more or less based on this data exploration. And yeah, we're getting more comfortable by using the techniques uh, we learned so far by actually using them in practice. Let's dive into it. Uh, to start, uh, we need obviously the Shiny package, uh, the package Broom, which uh, basically uh, loads in data pretty efficiently and the Tidyverse uh, for data manipulation and uh, data visualization uh, in the app. Yeah, and uh, what is the data we are looking at, which we want to use in our app? The data is from the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System called NICE, and it covers accidents reported from a sample of hospitals in the US. And yeah, you got a date for the accident, uh, although when the accident is reported, um, the age, sex, and race of the person which was injured. We have uh, the body part which was injured, the diagnosis, and uh, yeah, basic location uh, variable which says home, school, street or highway, etc. And we have also the primary product uh, which was uh, associated with the injury. We have a look at that. Uh, in the next uh, section, and uh, a brief story how the accident occurred. And also a weight variable, because this is only a sample of hospitals in the US. And if you want to scale it to the whole US, you might use the weight uh, variable to do that. So I have included here the code how to get uh, the data but you can uh, look it up in the, the actual book as well. And we have uh, three data sets. Uh, the main data set, as I described before, we have here a small loconate and we have um, the, this product code column, which, which uh, only gives code for the products involved. And we have uh, another data frame, which actually gives us uh, the names for the product codes. So uh, yeah, it's human readable. And we have um, another data frame uh, for the population for different age and uh, sex groups. So we can have uh, our data uh, later on relative to the population in this specific group. Yeah, that's basically a first look on the data. Um, and before we want uh, to build our app, um, yeah, we actually simulate practice by doing a little data exploration. And that's the next chapter. How would you look at the data? Yeah, if you just received it, you might want, uh, you might be interested in specific products, uh, how many accidents happened uh, for, uh, for example, in the book, uh, toilets as a product. You, so you filter for the product code for toilets and you get uh, around about 3000 uh, uh, accidents related to that. And uh, then you might want to count uh, how many uh, accidents happened in different locations. And so you count that and sort uh, yeah, by the 
maximum number. So in the home, for example, the most accidents happened, uh, happens related to toilets. You do this again uh, with body parts. Most of the time the head is involved and maybe for diagnosis as well. That would be the first part of your data exploration. And then you might think, uh, how about uh, a distribution uh, over the age, maybe uh, separated for male and female. So you are looking for a plot, which gives you that. And in the book, there is the example that the um, a distribution is uh, ab in absolute numbers and in relative to the population numbers. I've only included here the second one, uh, which we will start with in the app later on. And yeah, you're joining the population, uh, <coughs> population data frame, and then you create this rate variable which is the, yeah, the number of accidents uh, compared to 10,000 people. Yeah, you also weight uh, while counting with the weight column to have the scale of uh, the whole population, not only the sampled hospitals. And then you make a basic ggplot, a line plot uh, to plot this. Yeah, that might be your uh, data exploration. And now you want, uh, maybe you want yourself to do it for other products, uh, the same thing, or you might give that to people uh, who wanna do the same exploration, but have no knowledge in R. So you might think about building an app to do that. So the next step will be to build a prototype app and later on uh, um, step by step uh, add more components to this app or make it more beautiful. And yeah, uh, the prototype app is just what we've seen, only that the user can choose uh, the product. So we have here the UI of this of this uh, prototype app and this UI has first a uh, well, has the structure of a fluid page with uh, fluid rows and um, and columns or more or less the cells of the uh, single row and the first row uh, has only one column which has an input element uh, for the product code you can choose of all product codes which are in the data, which one you want to display. And the second row gives you uh, the mentioned tables uh, for the diagnosis, the body part and the location. And uh, the third row after that gives you the plot we've seen in the previous section. That's the UI part and the server yeah, that's uh, just that. We have a reactive uh, which uh, computes uh, the filtered uh, data frame of the injuries, uh, filtered by the in user input for uh, the product code. And uh, then we have the separate uh, tables right here, pretty similar to what we've seen before. And we've, uh, we have um, a reactive for the summarized uh, data frame or more or less uh, the, the data which goes into the plot. Um, it's mentioned in the book uh, that it's good practice to separate um, your, yeah, uh, the computing of the data you need for the plot and the plotting itself. So you can easier understand the code and easier generalize it later on. So that's the reason why the summary uh, 
is a reactive here. Is this is the data for the plot, and then it's used here uh, in uh, for for the actual plot in this render plot function. Yeah, that's the basic prototype app. And uh, we can have a look at this app if you haven't seen it yet or might want to look at it again. Oh, um, no, it doesn't work. Yeah. I can't see. I should have practiced this before. Yeah. Okay. Now I hope you see uh, the app, which gives you this input element where you can choose uh, toilets like before or something else like uh, basketball. And it gives you the three mentioned tables. And if you scroll down, it gives you the plot. Pretty basic. So we uh, get back to the presentation. So, and um, yeah, now we might want to uh, improve this app a little bit, uh, polish the tables. They are pretty long tables. Uh, you might not want to know uh, every uh, category, how much uh, accidents occurred in this. So you might only want to show the top five of it and use uh, some functions from the forecasts package, which do just that. Uh, this one uh, is sorting the levels of uh, the diagnosis uh, column by their number. And the second one lumps every other than the top five into one other category. And the result you can see just here. Um, yeah, and some little other changes, uh, we get the following app. Let's uh, run this app. Oh, I can't see the run button <laughs> because of the zoom frame. Uh, Let's get it to the other window. And now we can uh, see this slightly improved app. Be better like this. And now we have uh, the tables with the top five and the other categories. So it's a lot shorter and you can have it all in the same screen with the plot. It still can change uh, the product code. And yeah, that's uh, the first improvement here we've achieved. Let's get back to uh, the uh, notes. The next uh, step, which is explained in the book, is um, the, the user might want to have the plot in uh, relative numbers, like I've shown already, and in absolute numbers. For, yeah, if the uh, user is more interested in that. So uh, we have a new, um, a new column in the first row, which has an, a select input for rate and count. That's basically the only thing new here. And um, we have a updated version of this render plot function in the server, which has an if part for uh, the new uh, plot and an else part for the previous plot we've seen already. Yeah, 
and we can look at this uh, app as well, how it looks now. Might want to stop the old app. And now I hope you can see it. Uh, of course, the Zoom bar is over it for me, but you have here uh, a new uh, input item for rate to choose rate and count. And you choose count, you have the absolute numbers or the estimated absolute numbers because it's uh, scaled by the weights column. Yeah, it's rather small improvement but step by step we're getting to the app uh, the final app we want the last step uh, in the actual chapters of the book is um, to include um, yeah, a button uh, where you can ask uh, for a, a sampled uh, story for an accident of the chosen uh, product code and yeah, you achieve that by including this button in the UI section here. The button only says, tell me a story. And then in this output element, uh, the story is displayed. In the back end, it looks like this. We have this event reactive. We heard about that in the last talk by Priyanka. And uh, this uh, reactive um, is triggered uh, by the button, which uh, is here, the story button. Or uh, if the selected data changes, this was uh, the reactive uh, for the filtered data or the filtered by product code. And then uh, this re uh, event reactive is taken into this render text uh, function to be displayed in the output uh, element. And we can have an online look at this, I hope. Uh, is it this? No. Is, is it this one? the other one okay and uh, no uh, I guess I have the wrong link here maybe but I can show you the app uh, from my repo. So, um, narrative. Yeah, okay, now we have it. Um, now we have this new button, tell me a story. And every time you press the button, it tells you another story for, in this case, knife related uh, accidents. You can have also, uh, for example, the toilets we've seen before. And you can see it every time uh, reacts when you push uh, the button or when you change uh, the product code. Yeah, that's uh, basically the final app. After that in the exercises, I guess uh, the app is improved a little bit more. And 
um, I tried myself to improve it a little bit. And I want to show you that as well. Um, let's stop it here. Um, yeah, last time I asked a question how to add data uh, to a data frame. So I tried to include uh, the solution I found uh, in the example of this app and have another um, tab where you can add new data to it. I uh, like to show you that pretty quickly. Let's start by uh, running this app and kind of explain it afterwards. Uh, yeah. Now we see we have the same app, uh, more or less. I've included these uh, previous and next buttons uh, from the, I guess, third exercise or something like that. But uh, otherwise, it's the same on this tab, which I called analysis. And I had a second for adding data. And uh, actually, you can add data here. Let's suppose. Uh, we have someone who hurt his head. Uh, while jumping on the trampoline or something like this. No, what trampolines. So maybe he hits the ceiling in his living room, not a good idea. And you have this add button. And when you look at the data for trampolines, uh, and the last data point of it, you have it included into your uh, data. It's obviously uh, right now it's not stored in the data, uh, but you can, do that as well. I wanted to show how I did that. Okay, and there is there a question or something? No, might not. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, to show you shortly how I did that. Another uh, option for how to input and save out of Shiny, they have the Shiny survey package. Um, which basically like makes basic surveys. Um, I mean, it, it basically has pre-made apps for basic surveys. So, I mean, if there are other questions on like how to how to get data in and out and to keep it, I'm sure that their backend probably has some other suggestions on how to keep it. Okay, well, I might have a look into that. Uh, thank you very much. So, yeah. <laughs> um, to wrap it up, uh, I wanted to show you uh, the code for this example, which is basically more or less uh, the same code, um, which I used in a little example I put on uh, Slack. Uh, yeah, you have here this new structure. We are the tab set panel, which allows you to have uh, separate tabs. And then you have here, one tab for the analysis, which is uh, basically uh, the app, uh, which is shown in the book. And then another tab panel with all the input elements uh, right here, uh, including the button to add this uh, new data and um, in the server side, you have to um, make uh, the injuries uh, data frame and reactive value. I don't know if this is the best practice, but uh, this is the way I found it worked, uh, which is more or less uh, also a re reactive value. Yeah, uh, a value you can initialize uh, like this with a 
with an object, in this case, the data from injuries. And later on, you can update uh, this new reactive value uh, by uh, having the new value as an argument of uh, this uh, reactive container. And I do it here at the end. I have this observe event, which is triggered by the button. This is uh, the event which triggers it. And I take uh, the data frame, uh, the reactive uh, con container for this data frame, add a row with this uh, dplyr function, and then insert it again into uh, the new, uh, into the reactive container to, um, yeah, to update the value of this or update uh, this reactive value. And that's, uh, yeah, that's basically how to, how I did that. So, um, yeah, um, I would say I'm finished unless there are questions uh, or comments. That was really neat, the, um, the, the, the update in the values. So is there, it, does it, does it seem to you that it, it's impossible to do that without a reactive value um, expression in there? Do you uh, have the, 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 like the reactive alone wouldn't be able to do that, to do that update to the injuries? I couldn't find a way to do that mm. because you have an initial value for something which is not an input element. And um, yeah. I don't know how to initialize a reactive uh, with a value and then update it constantly. Yeah. Um, That's cool. I, I didn't find a way. So yeah. if anyone else knows a better <laughs> solution to this or, but I also um, found a, a solution to one of this, for, for one of those exercises for those uh, buttons we've seen before. Maybe I still got them for those buttons uh, for the previous and the next story. Uh, and um, this example solution I found uh, al also used this technique of a reactive value and, uh, uh, and um, the observe event uh, function uh, for, yeah, uh, changing uh, the index of uh, the story. And yeah, I'm quite comfortable that this is a good solution, uh, but maybe there's a better one for, for my example, which I don't know. Yeah, this is really neat actually, very neat and concise. I was thinking in fact, when we had asked you a question last week, um, so I had seen, um, something similar when I was doing. So there is a package called our hands-on table. I've not used it myself, but I think that is like an Excel. It, it gives you an Excel kind of um, view that it, it sh if you have, if you're displaying a table, you know, in your output using a render table or something, you can in that, like just as a, you know, you would write in an Excel row is what you can do using that package. But again, um, I've not used it myself, so I'm not sure how good it is. Mm -hmm. I sort of just wanted to add if in case you want to try. Um, what was the name of the package again? It's our hands-on table. I'll put it on chat. Okay. Could you yeah. type that in the uh, chat for everyone? Yeah, <laughs> might be helpful. Yeah, I just did. Oh, thank okay, you. thank you very much. <laughs> so... Uh, Another question or comment? The, um, I I do have a question. I was wondering about um, how the tables look in the um, example that you ran through. Where, see, if if I was if I was a user and was looking at the names of the you know like the column headers in there. 
diagon body ah, and okay. part and things like that. Now they're they're that's displaying the 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 table um, header as as it is in the stored data rather than in its most kind of human understandable form. So I was just wondering whether you knew if there was a way to, um, without having to modify the table itself, uh, sorry, without having to modify the stored data itself, whether upon displaying a table in Shiny, you can kind of uh, modify it, um, the, you know, the table column names and things like that. I would say uh, that Basically, in the Shiny apps, the tables are more or less the same as in uh, Markdown documents or something like that. Hmm. And for my part, I know about the GT package, uh, for example, where you can have uh, a little bit more beautiful tables. And there are several others which I haven't used yet. Uh, you can achieve that. And yeah, or something more dynamically like this, uh, I guess, reactable, uh, which we have seen, uh, I guess, in the UI chapter or something like that. Uh, this might be helpful to have nicer tables, nicer looking, or maybe yeah, we could change uh, the labels of uh, the data. Sure, sure. I would say that the the package that I've used predominantly for stuff like this is actually DT, which is, what is it? It's technically, it's it's the React or it's the JavaScript data table library. Um, and the tables are actually quite nice because you can search them, you can sort them, you can do all sorts of odd things to them. Um, and in those, you can easily change the column names by specifying what you want your column names to be. But if you're just going to use base, base shiny tables, I think you'd have to actually physically change uh, column names, which I mean, you're going to have to do regardless. I mean, even just by like putting in a new column name, you're in essence changing uh, right. okay. the data that's being displayed. I, I would say in, in general, uh, the rendering of, uh, of your tables is all the time is done in the server part of uh, the app. So it's up to this, what you use in the server part, uh, how it uh, will look like your, your table or how it's rendered. And in the UI part, uh, you only uh, associate, uh, you give it to an, um, an output uh, element and it's displayed, just displayed as is uh, created by the, the server. Cool. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, does anyone else have a question? Uh, what else? I've already stopped my presentation. <laughs> Um, I might have a question for the group. Um, I was, <coughs> I seen this, uh, yeah, uh, more or less uh, um, plots of the reactive graph last week uh, from Priyanka and from other people before. I know that there's this package, I forgot the name, where you can see uh, the structure of the app, but yeah, only the no. React log, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, does anyone know how to automatically just have a, a, a basic plot of the app, or, which is not dynamic, just one plot where you can see uh, the reactive graph or produce the reactive graph? Uh, I haven't found anything about that. I have the same question. <laughs> we got into that. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking of it before I was, oh, maybe not, <laughs> yeah. You can get the static 
plot of the reactive after like at the end of the react log plot log whatever the package is but it's not really going to tell you what the reactivity is until you start clicking things because as much as you can put as many things into into an app it doesn't really know like where it's really going to go until until you force it to and that's that's the thing with the with the react log it's actually recording where the reactivity goes rather than essentially making a dag and telling you like where where it thinks things will go okay oh However, it is quite useful to then like go in, like click some more things and refresh it and then be like, oh, okay, so now I've done this. And so now you've got like a block of uh, a block of reactivity up here and one down here. And it's like connecting one from the top that like somehow now affects the bottom. Um, the other thing is, is with a reactive log. Um, so if you don't actually put like the event reactive button to say like, okay, I've made all my changes now go and, and do your thing. Um, it will constantly update. So like, say you have, um, so you have a thing where you can select as input multiple. And so you can choose like, uh, you know, your favorite candy. So you can choose Snickers, M&Ms. As soon as you then put in like a Kit Kat, it then recalculates everything on the fly. And so if before the graph comes up, you put in another thing, it doesn't then like add that in while it's doing it. It will completely recompute for the KitKat, and then it'll go back and it'll recompute again for peanut M and M's. And then, God forbid, you change something else or like have a number that like you're scrolling on. If you're actually scrolling in the number, it will recompute every single time. So one of the easiest ways to absolutely crash an app is by not having a button to say, "Now I want you to recalculate," um, and just letting it recalculate when it wants. It's it's useful when you can't really make it do a whole lot. But when when it actually really has to do something on the back end, um, not forcing it to wait uh, can get you into some real trouble. Right, and uh, uh, I agree totally on that. I think button is usually very useful. So I think just want to add one more thing. So and there is a REQ sort of, I think required function. So rec function, which I think will eventually come in uh, the chapters uh, moving forward. Uh, and that I've um, figured is is also useful. So you could use the you you could use it like saying rec inside an observe. You can say rec and then the input field that you are looking to, you're you're expecting to change. So when if you do that, basically you are saying this this observe would only happen if there is a change in that value. So that could be another thing that could help in this situation that you're that we're discussing. I've also found the rec value is useful when you're first booting up an app because uh, if you don't actually have all of your input values with like default values, a lot mm -hmm. of times it'll error out the the app because it's like, well, we can't find the actual, um, like we mm -hmm. can't find the input to these three things to actually mm -hmm. calculate your first output. Um, but if you put a rec in, then it will hold off on the output and it will basically just give a blank space, which is, okay. which is useful uh, because otherwise it'll air out and it'll be like, you can't call a reactive. Yeah, I've, I've been in that situation where, you know, the, there is a graph being plotted at the bottom after you display a chart and there is a, for that first few seconds, there is that error and then it goes away. So yeah, yeah I know what you're saying. And so rec is useful to get around that. And if it, and sometimes it actually, sometimes it won't go away it will be like, oh, well, since you now need like this second part for this third part, we're just gonna crash out on you. So that rec is definitely useful for that as well. Um, okay, so uh, there doesn't seem to be much else uh, under discussion today. Um, uh, there, there were a couple of things in the um, the code.
that I hadn't used before that were not so much shiny related as as kind of our tidyverse type syntax. So, for example, where he uh, where the um, there was a function for kind of collapsing and counting a table and presenting the top five um, uh, uh, factor levels or whatever for for a given table, um, and within that there was a there was an operator I don't think I've even seen that was like a kind of colon equal um, thing. Is it is this a, a relatively new thing within the sort of tidyverse syntax? Do you do you know? Because I've never had cause to use it. Is that the the walrus operator? Yes. Yeah. 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 I think it's like um, when you do metaprogramming and use like quasi quotation, like um, quoting and unquoting stuff. Um, then that's what you need to, I think, basically to un unquote the left side or something like that. Um. Right. Wait, hold on. <laughs> what the walrus operator? Or did I hear that wrong? Yeah, I heard. Yeah, it. I, no, I, 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 I've, I've seen it. It was introduced into Python uh, uh, six months, twelve months ago, or something, and they referred to it as the walrus operator. I didn't realize that <laughs> the same thing yeah. existed in R. Um, I think if if you're really interested in into that, you can uh, read up on it in the advanced R book in the meta programming section. Yeah. Okay. Wait, hold on. What is the walrus operator? Is the colon equal? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that one is so if you are unquoting your left hand side, uh, that's the only way that, are, that you can then assign something on your right. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. It's been in there for a while, but only if you're using a lot of non-standard evaluation does it ever really come into any sort of relevance. I'd never heard of that called a walrus before. Then again, I've never referred to two exclamation points in a row as bang, bang. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Maybe it's also just Hadley who calls it walrus operator. <laughs> I, I think it's probably called that in, in other cases as well. But I was searching for walrus operator and I was like, I can't find this. What? Now that they've started using brackets instead of exclamation points and uh, Quo and unquo. I'm like, I this is this is now getting confusing. I understood one way to do this. Now you've got another, and now everyone's writing glue this way. I'm like, I'm I'm, I'm lost. <laughs> cool. Right. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, next week, uh, Shamsuddin we'll be talking about the uh, workflow chapter, which I think covers things like um, debugging and um, uh, profiling shiny apps, um, though I haven't read it yet. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully I'll see, uh, we'll see uh, a lot of you here next week as well. And then there's further things. I think it's the graphics the following week and then kind of user interaction the following week. Um, great. Thanks so much for everyone uh, coming along again. Oh, one last thing. Oh, uh, okay. uh, so how is everyone um, doing good on the exercises for the chapters? I was wondering if we should maybe pause like after the yeah. next session. We should meet up and just discuss the exercises. Just for idea. Sorry, uh, Priyanka, you want, uh, would it be okay if we go through the exercises in the Slack group? Is, is there a specific one you want to um, uh, talk No, about? I, I don't have any specific one, at least not at this moment. I, I can come back uh, sure. as I'm doing them. That's okay. Okay, cool, cool. Um, great, okay. Right. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, we'll see you all next week. And thanks, Dave. Thanks, for Ross. Thanks, Dave. All right. Thanks. thanks. Bye. Thank Dave. Thanks, Bye. Dave. Bye. Bye. Bye to all. Bye.